You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. What God wants from you. We are endeavoring to proceed through a sermon series entitled When God Calls Your Name Twice and investigating those occurrences in the Bible, those seven occurrences in the Bible, we are at occurrence number five, having seen Samuel, Samuel, Moses, Moses, Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, and now we move to the New Testament, Martha, Martha. In some instances, God calls somebody twice who he has never talked to before, like Samuel or or Moses, and other times it's somebody who he has relationship with already and is familiar with, which is the case here with, with Martha. And it hasn't been too long since we explored this text as part of the One Thing series. Uh, and so, uh, sorry, not sorry, that we're looking at it again and that many of the same observations that were made then then are still relevant now. Why? Because the text is the text. Amen? I can't be making up stuff just to make it different. Amen? But here's the exciting thing. We're different. We're in a different place, and I am hopeful and prayerful that whatever uh, fruit might have been gleaned or grown uh, when you heard it the last time, those that had the privilege of, of hearing the word of God preached in this, from this passage, um, that there's been some fruit, and there'll be some further fruit today based upon what we do here together. But it's an exciting time because if you look in Luke chapter um, 10, it's exciting because the scripture says Jesus is coming. Amen. And Jesus and his disciples were on their way, and he came to a village where a woman named Martha was there. And so, again, can you imagine the excitement of knowing that Jesus is coming? And overall, I just want us to focus in, in this regard. Jesus is coming, so what are you going to do? You need to prepare. Amen? And the question is just, what are you preparing to do? And what you're preparing to do has everything to do with your priorities. Amen? It's an understatement to say that as you set priorities in your life in general, that that is, that is one of the most singularly important things that you can do. Why? Because priorities determine pursuits. This is my big flashing sign. If you don't hear anything else, I want you to take this away. Your priorities determine your pursuits. Amen? And you don't even have to have stated priorities because your pursuits will tell what your priorities are. Amen? And so you may say, I'm not pursuing that, but, but we can look at your life and you can look at my life and we can see how you spend your time and your treasure and your talent. It will tell us everything about your pursuits. And those pursuits, they, they're driven by, they, they are based upon the priorities that you've set in your life. And you see a great contrast here in terms of priorities because Jesus is coming and you need to prepare. Martha says Jesus is coming. Martha is practical. She is thinking about Jesus coming. As Jesus is coming, he's got at least 12 people with him. They're rolling 13 deep. At least 13 deep. Plus some other folks that's probably hanging on, hanging around. And they're all coming to my house. I have got to prepare. And Martha says, I've got to prepare to host. Amen? Amen. Why? Because in a, in a good way, there's nothing wrong with this. Martha's objective is I, I have to be a good host, and so I want to make a good impression, and we want to, to make sure that we increase our reputation. I, I want people to know that when you come and you hang out at Martha's, 
I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be able to put your feet up. It's going to be a good time. Can you imagine what would happen if we heard Jesus was coming now and he said, we, we're going to have, we're gonna have a, a food fellowship and the fellowship all for Jesus? We wouldn't say, somebody run out to, to, to Popeye's and grab, a, 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 grab some chicken. No, no, no. We can do better than that. Tony Lee, run home and get, your, get, get, get started on that spaghetti. Get started on it. Shara, where is that seven-layer salad? Kevin Little, we need that potato salad. Annette, girl, get home, get that strawberry shortcake, and put your foot in it. Sister Kim, where's that German chocolate cake? We ain't seen it in a long time, but we know you got it, so let's get with it. Peace out. Where is that barbecue sauce that everybody is always talking about? Jeff and Velma? Heavy lift. Where are them little lamb lollipops that y'all be making? And we need jerk chicken and brown stew chicken. And you know, whenever they show up, they will be bringing jasmine rice. Amen. That's, that's, that, you don't even have to ask Jeff and Velma about Jasmine Rice. That's, that's, that's with everything that they Because we would want to be prepared to, to host, and we want to be able to leave a good impression. We want the, Jesus and his disciples to say, we came over to 1645 Wilson, and we got it in. And there's nothing wrong with that priority, but it doesn't line up necessarily with the kingdom priority that Jesus is trying to emphasize in this passage. Amen. Again, when we think about Samuel, Jesus had a, I mean, the, 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 the call to Samuel was a call to relate, and it was a revelation of God's plans. And with Moses, it was a call to work, and it was a revelation of God's presence. With Abraham, it was a call to obey, and it was a revelation of God's provision. With Jacob, it was a call uh, to transform, and it was a revelation of God's promises. With, Mark, uh, with Martha, it's a call to focus, and it's a revelation of God's priority. Jesus is coming. Martha says, then we got to prepare the host. Mary said, Jesus is coming. We got to prepare to hear. That's an entirely different priority. And if you have a different priority, beloved, you will have a different pursuit. We saw what was important that Mary, that Martha was trying to solve for because she was concerned about many things, and they're not things that are bad to be considered, but she was considering many things. Mary also was considering what Jesus described as one thing, and she was preparing to hear. She wasn't preparing to host, and if you're going to prepare to hear, you're going to have a, a different pursuit. First of all, anytime, and I've told you this many, many times. But if you're going to prepare to hear the Word of God and you're going to be prepared to worship, you're going to be in a place where you want to be able to avail yourself fully of what God has for you in a worship uh, situation or when the, the Word of God is revealed, you have to have the right attitude. Amen? Your attitude matters. I mean, you have to be living in expectation of what God can do. If you don't believe anything can happen in here, nothing will happen in here. Or God will drag you along and reveal some things to you anyway, but it helps to have the right attitude. It also helps to have what? The right appetite. Your appetite has to be right. Amen? Your appetite has to be right. You don't want to ruin the meal that God has for you in worship. You don't want to ruin the meal that God has for you in fellowship. You don't want to ruin the meal that God has for you as he reveals truth to your mind through the word of God by snacking on what the world offers. You will ruin your appetite. I don't know how many times growing up I was warned that I needed to stay out of the cabinets. I needed to stay out of the refrigerator because dinner was being prepared and you don't want to ruin 
your appetite. And my response was always, my appetite's not going to be ruined. It's just going to be satisfied. I'm, I'm good now. I don't want, but you're going to ruin your appetite for what your mother prepared for you. Amen. And in this case, you're going to ruin your appetite for what your father has prepared for you. So your attitude matters. Your appetite matters. And of course, your activity matters. You don't crave certain things uh, unless you do certain things. Amen. Your activity matters. Me and Brother David were just talking uh, yesterday about uh, his marathon experience. And I, I was saying to him, after you finish that 26.2 miles, I know Brother David did not say the only thing I want in this world is a hot cup of coffee. I just, he told me, he said, if Lake Michigan was closer, I would have jumped in it and drank the whole thing. Just why? Because certain activities make you crave. You said, I need to I have a, a hunger and thirst for right. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after. You're not going to pant after God unless you uh, have an appetite and an activity and doing those things that will allow you to get to the place where you are craving to hear the word of God. And so that's what happens before you hear him. And then here's something important that you have to understand as well, that when you're in his presence, you need to prioritize being in attendance. So, again, so you need to be in his presence. But this is the thing that many of us will blow. Not only just prioritize attendance, you got to pay attention. Mary was at Jesus' feet. It shows that, that, that she had, that she was indicating submission, amen? And it was indicating a readiness. I, I can't miss. I don't want there to be any, she wasn't just in the room. She wasn't sweeping up. She wasn't mopping. She didn't have, she wasn't on her phone. She wasn't trying to multitask. She says, I need to hear from God. And if you're preparing to hear, I want to sit right at his feet. I don't want to miss anything. I want to pay attention. You know how often that you have gone particularly to an, an event for somebody. Think about it as a, for, for one of your children. They want you to not only come and see what they're doing, they want you to pay attention. There's nothing worse than a child at one of these basketball games or volleyball games or, or, or soccer tournaments do something, look to the stands to see if you saw it, and they see you on your phone. Did you see, Dad? Did you see what I did? Mom, did you see? You didn't see. You were there, but you weren't paying attention. And you know what happens? You don't really get credit for being there unless you're present and paying attention. It's one of the things that is fundamental to a relationship that's going to be that's going to have effective communication or an effective relationship. Jesus said, uh, the Father said in, in Matthew chapter 17 at the, the transformation, this is my Beloved son in whom I will pleased, hear ye him. It's one of the fundamental, those four fundamental uh, uh, elements. Again, it, he says, this is, my, this is my son. That's acceptance. That's my son. This is my beloved son. That is affection. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's affirmation. And this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. That means pay what? Attention. I'm in relationship with him, and I want you to be able to say, and that's the same kind of elements that have to be present in any relationship that you, that you have that will be valued and so that the person feels valued and so that you understand that, that that's the way it should be. There has to be acceptance. There has to be affection. There has to be affirmation, and there has to be attention. So pay attention. As Malcolm X's character in Malcolm, uh, in Spike Lee's movie, I mean Denzel Washington's character, told uh, his friend Shorty, you got to pay it all your mind, what mind you got left. 
Shorty said, I can't pay that Muslim thing no mind. He said, you better pay it all your mind what mind you got left. That's what I'm telling you. Pay attention with your full mind, whatever mind you got left. Pay attention. It used to be frustrating to me uh, at Circle Y. We used to, many times we were, you know, junior week as we got older, we would be the workers. Uh, and it was junior camp was, was going on. And so we weren't in the program. We were on staff. We were workers. And either many times, particularly me and Pastor Tyrus, we would either be in the dish room doing the dishes or we'd be on pots and pans. Amen. And that's a whole nother sermon about how you got to prepare if you want to do pots and pans and do it right. You got to you got to prepare. You got to pre-soak. You got to you got they always burn the grits. And if you don't get in there early and, and soak that pot, you're going to have a time on your hands later. And so, again, there were some great object lessons there. But what would happen is we knew. That from the end of breakfast, we would always, we would always uh, stop breakfast. Uh, uh, you know, we didn't enjoy it the, the entire time because we knew we had work to do. But we also knew that there was going to come a time when they stopped us from working because it was going to be time for staff Bible study. And I didn't understand so much why we had to stop. I got work to do. I got pots to soak. I got stuff. I'm trying to get that done so I could get on with the rest of my day. But they used to make everybody stop. There was no other activity in the dining hall. You had to come to Bible study. Why? Because they prioritized paying attention when the word of God was broken apart. I've never forgotten that. It frustrated me early, but I understand it now. How important was it to say, no, there's no other activity that's supposed to be going on. It's Bible study time. Pay attention. No, I can keep the door open. Pots and pans was here. The door was right there. I can see. No, that's not good enough. Your attention will not be on fully on what you need to, so I need you to pay attention. That's got to be the priority. And when you think about kingdom priorities, it makes sense for us to just review some that you have heard of and, and, and remember before. But when you talk about the kingdom, it's always do this first. First always indicates that there's some kind of priority. And if you want to be able to be a, uh, a person that lives according to the kingdom and your life operates and moves according to the kingdom agenda, then you can look to the word of God and see what your priorities should be regardless of what your priorities are. I'm telling you that God will tell you what your priorities should be. Amen. So that when you look at Matthew um, chapter, excuse me, you look at Matthew chapter five and you look at verse 24, you can be, be reminded that says, therefore, if you're, verse 23, if you're offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Why? Because the kingdom priority is there must be fellowship before there's worship. Amen? You, you need to be restored here before you can be looking to. You can't go to God knowing that you got an art against your brother. He said, listen, first go and make that right. Then come see me. Fellowship before worship. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. There's discussion about all of these material things that you're worried about. He said, don't worry about those things. Seek ye first. It's got to be the spiritual, beloved, before the material. That's a kingdom priority. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5, it says this. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there at this time you got a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's always purity before ministry. Purity. Handle some self-business before you get in everybody else's business. Purity before ministry. And I, ooh, Matthew 12 and 29. I'm sorry. If it's not good to nobody else, it's good to me. 
Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. The kingdom principle is there must be binding before there's loosing. And the application for you, beloved, is God is looking for you to bind up some things in your life before he looses blessings in your life. Let's just get into what you really want to talk about. You say, I'm looking for God to do some things in my life. He says, I'm looking for you to do some things in your life. I'm looking for you to have to bind some things up. I'm looking for you to have some discipline around some things. I'm looking for you to have some diligence around. I'm looking for you to bind your flesh. And when you start to bind, I'll start to loose. There's always binding before loosing. It's a kingdom principle. Inside before outside. He, he told the Pharisees, you, you, you always want to wash the outside of the cup, but you'll leave the inside all jacked up. He says, listen, clean the inside first and then clean the outside. God is always working inside out. It's always inside, beloved, before, before the outside. In, in, in Luke chapter 14, I wish Pastor Holder was here because Pastor Holder would tell you, write these down if you write things down. Amen? That's, that's, that's what I tell you. Write, write things down. I mean, I, I don't see how. I've said five of them already. I just don't see how if you're not writing things down. You'll never remember them. You'll never remember them. But you got to pay attention. This is, this is the kingdom. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? What's the kingdom principle? There's got to be contemplation before there's commitment. God is looking for you to contemplate the cost, and then he says, I want you to count the cost, but I want you to count that the cost is worth it in terms of discipleship. But he says there's got to be contemplation before there is commitment. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, that that widow of Zarephath, she said, I, I don't have anything left. And she saw Elijah, and Elijah, he said, yeah, give me something to eat. She said, all I have is just this little cruise of oil, and I got this, this little uh, a barrel of meal. I'm going to make a, a meal for me and my son, and then we're going to die. Elijah said, that's okay, that's what you're going to do. But here's what I need you to do. Make that meal, but, 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 but make me a little meal first. I know you don't have much, but make, make, make me the meal first. And then what will happen is that that barrel of oil, that barrel of uh, meal will never run out and that cruise of oil will never run die, dry. Why? Because there's always got to be sacrifice before satisfaction. It's got to be sacrifice before satisfaction. We get that wrong all the time. We're always consuming all the way to the margins and then wonder why God is looking at us and saying, you have not done what you need to do with me first. I need you to give me your first fruits, not your last fruits. And it's got to be sacrificed before satisfaction. And then in 2 Kings chapter 5, and this is Naaman with the prophet Elisha, he told him, that you needed to go wash in the waters of the Jordan River before he could be healed. And he was insulted because he thought the Jordan River was a nasty river. He said, why would I go to that nasty river? And his servant said, if he told you some hard thing to do, so, uh, you know, do, you, when you do it, it's, it's easy enough. Just go do what he asked you to do. And that principle, that kingdom principle that is there is that there has to be follow through before there's breakthrough. Naaman saw a breakthrough. He saw his leprosy healed, but God needed him and the prophet, through the prophet Elisha, to follow through on what God had said. Go dip seven times, and when you do that, you'll be on. But he didn't want to do the follow through initially, and so he wasn't going to get the breakthrough. But he got the breakthrough when he first did the follow through. And so now we see another kingdom principle right here that that we see between Mary and Martha. It's a kingdom principle. It's a kingdom priority. Again, I understand it's important to host, but it's hearing before hosting. Always. Jesus says the kingdom priority, as much as he wanted to, he would want to come here and taste Tony Lee's spaghetti. 
he would tell him it's better to, to hear than to host. Amen? And if it takes a little longer to get the spaghetti afterwards, then that's fine. But we need to hear and we need to be present and we need to pay attention. And if you have a, a, a competing agenda between hearing and hosting, you're going to have a problem. Martha told Jesus, we got a problem. She said, listen. Tell her, don't you care? The answer is no, by the way. Don't you care <laughs> that my sister, no, has left me to do, no, the work by myself, no. I don't care. Kind of care. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus, we have a problem. And in verse 41, Jesus agrees with her. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Jesus says, yes, we do have a problem. It's the same problem. you saying, Martha, you tell her, say, hey, tell Mary to help me. He says, Martha, yes, we do have a problem. And Martha's prescription to the problem was, Jesus, tell Mary to get on my page. Tell her to help me. She sees I can't do all of this by myself. It's 13 people in here. And nobody cleaned those toilets. Nobody washed those floors. The stuff has not been put up. I asked her to do this. And the next thing I know, I had told her to do this. And the next thing I know, she is at your feet listening. But I had asked her to take that garbage out. And she didn't do it. Tell her to help me. He said, Martha. Martha, showing some, some tenderness, showing some restoration, showing some, some emotion. Martha, Martha, you're troubled about many things. The prescription is not for, for, uh, for Mary to get on your page. The prescription is for you to join Mary on my page. That's the prescription. I need you to join Mary on my page. And isn't it awesome to know that Jesus is saying, I need you to get on. Um, he said, Mar Mary has chosen the better part. It's only one thing that's really needed. And the one thing in terms of a kingdom priority is to hear and not to host. We get so worried and distracted by so many things. Things that seem to be important. Let me say it this way. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many things you can focus on. Priorities compete for one another in the hierarchy of what you want to get done. You can't do everything. Amen? So you can't have, I don't know, call it 15 priorities when you really know there's only three or four things you can get done. And you will do those things that you prioritize because you'll pursue those. Amen? And depending on how long it takes or, or what's involved, it does not leave you as much time uh, or attention or bandwidth to do anything else. You can't be present Going back to the kids' example, you cannot prioritize being at your children's weekend activities and play golf on Saturday and Sunday, 36 rounds. A round of golf takes four hours. You do that twice, that's eight hours. You do that, you're likely not coming to church. <laughs> you're likely not seeing your family. That's what they have that phrase called being a golf widow. There are people that love golf like that. I am not one of those. It's not a priority, and my game reflects that. Nobody has to tell you that, my, that golf is not a priority. All you got to do is get to the first tee, and you're like, you really don't play a lot, do you? Amen? 
But I know why I play the way I play. Because I have not prioritized putting in all the time that you need to put in in order to be good. You need to practice and you need to you need to play and you need to and you need to get on the range and you you got to be able to putt and you got to be able to work on your short game. You got a lot of stuff you have to do and that's fine. If you want to make that one of your priorities, just know you can't do that and do four or five other things, particularly things that might relate to your family. These priorities compete for one another with one another and you got to figure out what are the priorities I should have in my life and I'm telling you the priorities you need to begin to think about are the ones that Jesus says in the in the scriptures are the ones that are important there's got to be fellowship before worship there's got to be purity before ministry there's got to be the inside before the outside there's got to be the spiritual before the material there's got to be contemplation before commitment there's got to be sacrifice before satisfaction there's got to be hearing before hosting. It's got to. Why? Because these are kingdom priorities. And your priorities will determine your pursuits. And your pursuits tell on you. Your pursuits tell on you. Every week at, at my job at Old Brass, I know that a couple of my partners have prioritized listening to certain podcasts and, and other things that are industry related that are really, really good in terms of helping us to further how we do our work in private equity. I have not prioritized those things, and I don't really engage in those discussions. I'm waiting for them to talk about the Word of God. So I can tell you one thing I have prioritized. I didn't listen to the All In podcast, but I can quote some scripture for you. And I can't tell you what I preached this weekend. I can tell you where my head was on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I can give you a five-minute uh, synopsis of what my message was, and I can guarantee you that will bring more life uh, to, your, to your life, not both now and in eternity, than whatever you listen to and prioritize in terms of that. And not that you can't do both, but you can't do everything. And if I'm going to choose what I'm going to choose, i got to put the big stuff in first. And that's got to be kingdom. That's got to be the word of God. It's got to be the fact that I want to pay attention. You can't afford to, to be distracted by the cares of this world. Jesus told that parable in Matthew chapter uh, 13 about, about the, the sowing the seed, and some fell by the wayside, and some fell in stony soil, and some fell in thorny soil, and then some fell in good soil. But it was that thorny soil, and it says the weeds and the cares of this world choked out the seed and so that it became unfruitful. Again, that's what happens. Worry and, and choking and distraction. If we're worried about everything else but what we should be worried about, we'll never be able to have that seed fall in good soil. And when it falls in good soil, that's how it brings some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. You got to be able to hide the word and then you got to be able to, to, to heed the word. Amen? And the only way you'll hide the word and heed the word is if you hear the word. That's how it falls in the good soil. You hear it, you hide it, and then you heed it. That's got to be the priority. Don't be taken out by a lack of discipline before you get to a place where you can get that good seed in that good soil. Wayside, stony, thorny, good. There's a progression that's there that we don't have time to really explore. But you can be taken out of your game at any one of those levels. You can be taken out of your game any one of those places. It could be a lack of discernment. <laughs> it could be a lack of development. Or it could be a lack of discipline. The lack of discernment, you don't even know what you got. It falls on the wayside. The lack of development, there's stony soil. You didn't prepare the soil, so it just springs up quickly and it doesn't. And then there could be a lack of discipline. You allow the distractions of this world. So a lack of discernment, a lack of 
development, a lack of discipline. And the only way you get to have your, that word bring forth real fruit is through a love of discipleship. Hear the word. Hide the word. Heed the word. You got a greater shot of living a pleasing life with Jesus Christ if you prepare to hear. Your appetite, your attitude, your activity. Your posture of submission. When you're actually giving God your full attention. There's no way around this, and I'm going to say this because it's true. The reason you don't read your Bible every day is because it's not a priority. The reason why you can start out the year and maybe read through 15 chapters of Genesis but then when we come to August, you've completely fallen off. It's not a priority. And there's nothing you can say to me or I can say to you about that if I'm not doing it. Because if it's a priority, I'll pursue it. And I'll be on task in August like I am January 3rd because it's a priority. One of the things that, <clears throat> and I'll just share this with you, in my relationship with my, my wife, over the years, we have struggled to be consistent in terms of praying together. And as much as I would profess it was a priority, it didn't happen. And Kim would just look at me and just say, if it was a priority, we'd do it. And it would bother me because, like, no, it, it, it is. It is, baby, it is a priority. It's like this, when have we done it? It's spotty. It's episodic. It's not consistent. And trying to build a consistent prayer life, if it's a priority, then it becomes a pursuit. And you actually get it done. If you can't get it done, it's because you're not pursuing it. And God wants you to pursue kingdom things. And there's literally no excuse. There's no place to hide. It's nothing you can do. It's a, it's a do or not do. Either you did it or you didn't do it. Just like in that movie, Amistad. Remember what he said? The, the lawyer comes to the, to, to, to the tribe and he says, we're going to try to get you out. He tried to get him to translate that in Dembe. He says, why are you hesitating? He said, because in Dembe, there is no word for try. You either do or you don't do. <laughs> That's hard, isn't it? You're going to try to get us out? You're going to try to get us free? Either you do it or you don't. Either you pursue it and you make it a priority, you pursue it and you get it done, or you don't. Martha, I know you prepared to host, and that's a nice distraction, but in the competing priorities in your life, preparing to host is not as important as preparing to hear. And guess what? If I can feed 5,000 and walk on water, if I can heal the sick, I can, I can raise the dead, I'm pretty sure I can make Kevin Little's potato salad. And Tony Lee's spaghetti. And Velma's lamb lollipops. And Annette's strawberry shortcake. And Sister Kim's German chocolate cake. And Shara's seven-layer salad. I'm pretty sure I could do it. Matter of fact, go in the kitchen. I already did it. <laughs> While you in here worrying about hosting, you needed to be here hearing. Father, thank you. 